Our moderators for today's discussion are Jacob Wilson, Illinois Director for the Campus Election Engagement Project, and Alexandria Sims, C Campus Election Engagement Project Fellow and a PhD candidate at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology studying organizational leadership. With that, I would like to turn over the floor to Jacob and Alexandria to introduce our panelists and begin the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today and uh, to our panelists. Uh, we'd like to welcome our panelists and thank them for their time and joining us today for this conversation. Today, we are joined by Brian Pryor, uh, who is the Deputy Director of Election Operations for the Illinois Board of Elections, and Kathy Michael, who is the McLean County, uh, I'm sorry, McLean County Clerk. That's a mouthful. Uh, and we, uh, unfortunately, Doug Johnson from DeKalb County, uh, who uh, is unable to join us today, um, but we will be very well served with both, both Brian and Kathy. Uh, and with that, I'd love to turn it over to Alexandria to uh, start with uh, the first couple of questions for us. Thank you again to Kathy and Brian for being here today. Our first question is, what lessons have been learned so far in 2020 that you are applying to the November election? What lessons have been learned? Yes. Lessons. Hmm. Well, I think stuff that I probably already knew because I'm old is that um, just you always have to prepare for anything and be prepared for the unexpected just you know a lot of times my no offense to you younger people you little whippersnappers they uh, will say well we've always done it this way boss I go well we're not going to do it this way this time okay and so, and they get it, you know, because after the first kind of mistake, it's like, oh, yeah, we should have done it that way. But this is just a whole new ballgame. So we're just all learning new things, even me, after all these years. And you just have to be prepared for it, educated on the facts, and don't let emotional things get in the way, you know, because we have so many things going around and you know attacks and this and that and boy you just have to really steal yourself to be in this business certainly so i'm going to take uh, a little bit different approach and just uh kind of relate some of the lessons learned specifically to the actions that have been taken in illinois uh, with exception to uh the vote by mail expansion bill that was passed uh, also known as public act 101-641 and 642 so some uh, measure that the legislature in conjunction with the governor took in order to provide expanded voting for those individuals that would otherwise be challenged for going to the polls due to COVID-19. Um, some alternative polling locations have been put forth um, through that vote by mail expansion, also closing governmental offices uh, in order to ensure that we have uh, available polling locations because something that we saw during the primary election was specifically related to polling locations pulling out uh, last minute, which posed uh, more challenging to the election officials, such as Ms. Michael, uh, whereas we were on the just administrative side trying to provide the best information we could and uh, some legal direction as it related to different methods that they could uh, move forward with, uh, like some court relief in order to uh, change the way they handle uh, nursing home voters and things of that nature. Um, I think another thing that was learned was that you can never have enough standby election judges. So uh, that's something that we've been working in conjunction with the local election officials. We've actually have also been working with Facebook. That's more of a coordinated approach in, uh, through our public information officer, Facebook, and some of these other entities and just trying to ensure that we have appropriate coverage in moving closer to this November 3rd election. I can add one thing uh, on the election judges, and that was a really good point. Um, we've been blessed for, we've always done outreach. Um, and so, you know, we get used to, not used to, but you know, you have the flu season and things like that. So we always tried to have a wait list whenever we could. And boy, did that come in handy, right, Brian, this time. Um, we lost 100 judges within two days in March. We had 100 on the wait list. And at ISU, yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, ISU then right at that time 
mandated then the six foot distancing like two days before the election as well and ask us or really kind of mandated us to cut down from our 70 judges to 35. In a way that worked out in the past, it would have been, oh no, those 35 don't get to work. We go, we got a spot for you. And so they immediately signed up. They were just wonderful. And they were just so engaged and so happy to help. And so now that um, all the outreach from State Board of Elections, and thank you for that on Facebook and everything else, and the fact that this is the first time it's a state holiday. So we've had a lot of uh, uh, teachers sign up, a lot of the students for the first time, I think, isn't it, that 16-year-olds can assist, signed those up, got two ISU professors who signed up. That was a real, real help. So we feel, knock on wood, fairly secure right now, God willing, things don't get worse. But we, we now have a wait list, and I, I hope it stays that way. And just one other thing, if you don't mind, uh, just to dovetail off of Ms. Michael's comments as it relates to the election judges, I, I, I'm excited that uh, you had a great wait list to back up your jurisdiction, but I, you can never have enough. I'd rather have, uh, I would preach that the election jurisdictions have a wait list of 200, if, if that's possible. And it's a good thing if they don't get to serve, but I, I hope that we're pushing the message that we can take everything that we can get at this point because we just don't know what's going to happen. And as we take the phone calls still, and we've got a wait list now of I don't know how many, and one of my staff said, well, should we just tell them we don't have any work for them? I go, no, sign them up. I said, but explain it, explain it. Because guess what? You might need those 150 to 200 extra on your wait list. And as long as you explain it to people, especially this year more than ever, they get that. And they are more than eager to be on the wait list and they hope they get called, but they would understand if they didn't. Okay, so as how can campuses and community organizations work with local election officials? I'll start off on that one. We, we've had a really good relationship with Illinois State University because uh, we have experienced long lines at the university. And we've tried to figure out a way not to have long lines at the university. So we, we formed the ISU election team, which is uh, leaders there with students and the professors. And we put shout outs, you know, they send emails, we put up, uh, yeah, we work well together and they try to get the word out. It's reaching students and no offense to students is sometimes a challenge. I know when I was that age, I. I didn't like to read stuff and I'd like to go and have a sandwich, you know, but um, the students are just wonderful and, and have had a very good engagement as well. We have a lot of students signed up, but we have reached out over the last, I would say since 2016, when the new same day registration law came into effect. And you just have to reach out and ISU couldn't be more helpful and they get it, we get it, and we keep putting the word out as much as we can to pass it along and it's really been helpful. Do you want to add anything, Brian? Um, can you restate the question and just add a, a little bit of flesh to it? I can't hear you, Ms. Sims. How can campuses and community organizations work with local election officials? Um, just how, how can uh, the universities in Illinois partner with uh, election officials to, I guess, enroll poll workers or um, just understand the, the um, rules around voting? Certainly. Um, I wish I had more to add to that, but not being an actual election administrator, I think Ms. Michaels, uh, Ms. Michael, uh, appropriately addressed it. So. It's like anything else, it's just getting the word out. And especially um, voting by mail now this time, you know, we've had a lot of reduction in, in students on campus and doing online courses. Uh, we have to do the six foot distancing again, of course. Um, so if you have 2000 to 3000 students show up to vote in a room that now you have to be six foot apart, you're really going to stand in line for a really long time. So we have really been pushing the word out early voting. We have early voting sites on campus. Mm -hmm. um, but getting that word out is so important because if they don't read it, if they don't read our local newspaper, if they don't listen to our local radio, 
how do they get the message? And a lot of that is personal responsibility. But a lot of it is too, is ISU helping to send out mass emails and getting the word out is, yes, you have that right to go to your polling place and vote on election day. But you should also expect to stand in line. So if there's any, you know, be patient for that. But if there's any way you've made your decision, try to vote ahead of time. It would be very helpful for us and for you. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Ms. Michael. That's something that the State Board of Elections is pushing specifically from our Office of Public Information is it's don't don't wait. Uh, we have all these opportunities to vote early in Illinois, and we we ask that everybody take advantage of that, especially for this upcoming November election. Uh, something else that I just out of curiosity, I mean, uh, I'd like some input from the university side of things would be if there's it's getting the word out, but sometimes it's more specific to what that message is. So we're always open to advice from our county folks also. So you guys um, have a, a responsibility to your constituents and, and please inform us also so that we can, so that your comments can inform our messaging as it goes out to our social media uh, accounts and things of that nature. So just be mindful of that. It's a two-way street and we're happy to address things where we can, because as mentioned in kind of the dialogue or opening of uh, this meeting, you had mentioned some specific information related to misinformation, which we know is, is a big issue. So uh, having you guys inform our messaging is just as important as to what we send out and, and provide to all constituents and voters. That's fair. Okay. So there have been many efforts to recruit election day poll workers acro across the country. How is poll worker recruitment, recruitment going in your county across Illinois? And how are you working with campuses and or community organizations to recruit poll workers? Well, I sort of addressed this previously, so I'll just reiterate that, that we, we just do constant, you know, this is my 13th year, uh, and outreach is my thing. And it's just uh, communications is what, what I studied and things like that. And my mom told me I never stopped talking since I was two. So I think that helps. Uh, you just constantly communicate. And uh, like I said, we have a wait list and you can never stop doing that. And then just working with, we work with civic groups. You know, I'm, I've got five Zoom meetings in the next two days. And that, and whether it's a Zoom meeting or going to a rotary, you know, I've, I've got three rotaries in the next two weeks. Anything you can do to do that, you've just got, that's part of the job. So if you come in with a, no offense, an IT degree or something like that, and you're not really liking to get out and talk to people, that doesn't help in this situation because you've got to be outgoing. You've got to do outreach. You've got to pretty much say yes, because that's part of your job to get that word out about voting. And that's what we do here. And it, it really helps. More from the state side, um, we're working directly with the election authorities to assess need. So I know that just recently we had completed a survey uh, in trying to assess how many election judges jurisdictions believe they're going to be short or just kind of trying to get that information of where your where these jurisdictions are currently so that uh, we can provide any assistance that uh, we have resources for. So um, as part of that, there was kind of the first wave of workelections.com um, which is a poll worker recruitment tool through Facebook, uh, where we sourced uh, some different information and we're currently in the process of uh, breaking that information that was submitted by all these individuals that are wishing to be election judges and getting it to all those jurisdictions so that they uh, kind of like a lead list so that they have an opportunity to follow up with uh, these individuals directly. One thing I'd like to add too is um we could use more money. So if you send it our way, Fran, we'd appreciate it. Uh, all this outreach and everything is costly. Um, in a normal year, you, you can sort of get the word out and you're on radio and TV and all that stuff. But this time we need, I believe, a lot more judges. And I think you've seen that you know, at SBE uh, for uh, COVID related. And we've gotten some additional funding for that, thank goodness, that's gonna help with the uh, staffing pay and for the extra supplies we're going to need. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to pull this off. I mean, it, it would, we, we could do it, but it would be very challenging to voters and it might deter voters. So this has really helped to get some additional funding. The COVID supplies, for example, we just got four pallets of disinfectant from Anheuser-Busch. Thank you. 
I kiddingly said we were waiting for the beer, but it was just the disinfectant supplies, but that's okay, we're grateful. And, you know, so they paid for that. Well, we'd already, were buying some extra stuff too, so we're getting funding for that, because now we send out, which is gonna take more judges to monitor, we're gonna put the green X's on the floor so you're standing six feet apart. We're gonna have the disinfectants everywhere. We're gonna be wiping things down, but we gotta be careful not to wipe down the electronic equipment because it could damage it. So for me, I'm hiring more judges at each location that we didn't need to hire before. And that costs $200 a judge. And luckily I feel that we now have the funding to be able to do that, which is wonderful. Okay, you mentioned workelections.com and Facebook. Who can be a poll worker and how do they sign up besides that tool? You want me to take that, Patty? Want me to take that one, Brian? Um, why don't you take it and I'll, I'll text the one and you can let you know. Okay, normally, um, you know, we have election judge training. Okay, we'll have a big room downstairs and have food and lots of fun and and videos and now with social distancing and all of that concern, we have uh, hired a professional that was, we had funding to help with that. Um, do all of our videos now a little bit more professionally. And so now we can offer online uh, training for judges. So all new, ju it's not the same as hands-on, but it certainly helps. And they can sit at home with their cup of coffee or whatever and watch the the videos and get trained that way and then we can see you know online that they've taken the training they get a certificate online and then we place them and we only place them with veteran judges so that they feel secure so that that's how we do it the recruiting of course is with the outreach and we've had a flood of it and it's wonderful they can just go online and do the training and boy do they do it and then we can place them and it's working out wonderfully so, um, Kathy's always been ahead of the curve as it relates to her election judge training. I, uh, when I began my employment with the board, I had the opportunity to go and see uh, the training that her jurisdiction uh, engages with those potential election judges. So, we just commend you on that. But um, to, to the point of where people can go, so there is a, a section on the Illinois State Board of Elections website. Um, that has a comprehensive listing of election authority contact information, and it can be found at elections.il.gov. And then it would be under the information for voters tab. It's uh, the election authority's contact information. So all election judges are um, sourced or appointed through political parties, but more specifically through each individual election authority. So there is no one stop shop as it relates to. Um, coming to the State Board of Elections and indicating that you wish to be an election judge. And while we'll forward that information on to, those, to the jurisdictions, the best place uh, is to go directly to the election authority. So uh, the election authority information is, again, where I uh, mentioned, and you can reach out directly. Um, as it relates specifically to the qualifications of election judges, most college students uh, since that's the current audience, I'm just going to speak to that. Most college students would, uh, in fact, be able to be uh, election judges. It, it does uh, matter where they are registered. So if it's somebody that is uh, not registered within that specific jurisdiction, that specific jurisdiction, there are some limitations. Uh, and again, I can provide any specific information related to everything that I'm talking about. It's, it's going to be a written medium on our website. So. Uh, our website can be overly cumbersome, cumbersome sometimes, but I'd be happy to direct you guys uh, where to best find this information. That's a good point I almost forgot is our website. And luckily here, for some reason, if you just Google McLean County Clerk, my site comes up. That's either a good or a bad thing. And then just click on elections and it'll guide you right to you want to be a judge and you click on there and there's the form or you can email us and we'll get all that information. We get a lot of reaction from that. Um, so yeah, the website's obviously been great and I believe every county clerk has got a link to how to become an election judge. So just go and a good point on the registration. You've got to be a registered voter in the county in which you serve and of course that's an easy process too. Uh, you can do that online and contact your office and boom, you're registered there. If you want to change your registration to where you're going to college and then you can be a judge. 
once you pass the training. So what's the difference between poll workers and absentee election workers? Repeat that. What's the difference between poll workers and absentee election workers? I'm not sure what you mean by absentee election workers. I'm wondering if you mean a poll worker, I consider uh, some people will hire some folks that don't necessarily have to do judge training that will help with other things. And you hire them as part-time staffers. All of our poll, poll workers are take the test and become a judge. Uh, for absentees, are you talking about the mail-in balloting situation? Because that has been very exciting. We've had almost 11,000 um, responses, applications requesting a ballot. Well, the most we've ever had in our lifetime is 1,500. So now we're at 11,000 and we're expecting 20,000. So we hired then the people to help with the absentee or the mail-ins as staffers, part-time staffers. Con conveniently, they were also election judges. So they have that experience anyway. They get paid $10 an hour got downstairs in the community room and we were ready for all those absentee or mail-in ballot applications to come in. It's just like a war room down there. We'd get 500 a day and process them. We got our first electric envelope opener. That was an exciting moment for all of us. And so we've got the same team that's hired, if that's what you were referring to, for now, because guess what? September 24th is the first day the ballots are going to be mailed. So we're sitting here on this 11,000 and growing, and of course some counties have a lot more and less. And can you imagine people are anticipating, because we've been getting calls, where's my ballot, where's my ballot? We have a, also a whole conference room set up with eight phones to answer, where's my ballot, where's my ballot? So we were prepared for that too, and that's where that part-time help comes in so great. So now we're ready after the 24th. Imagine how many of those 11,000 are gonna come in at once. And so we've prepared for that with our whole team. From a, just from a legal perspective, there, to answer your question, in Illinois, there is no difference. An election judge is, uh, they go through the same exact process. Uh, they need to be referred to the election authority by the party, and then it goes through uh, confirmation, a, a somewhat of a confirmation process, which goes through the uh, judicial system, which appoints these election judges. So uh, all over the country, there's these, these different approaches to people that serve as poll workers, but in Illinois, it's specific to election judges as defined by the Illinois election judge. And, and with that, can you tell us a little bit about how you will be processing those uh, mail ballots as they're returned? Uh, what is the, I guess, Illinois statute or, or guidance that you have of when you can start processing those ballots once you receive them back? That's a good question, isn't it, Brian? And that's a nice legal question as well. There used to be a difference between counting and, I mean, there is a difference between counting and processing. It's illegal to count the ballots or to reveal those results before seven o'clock on election night. By processing, I'm not gonna go into a great deal of detail for security reasons, but let's just say they get processed as they come in and placed in a very secure, we have um, fireproof safes that they will go into. They are all monitored and I think this is important and I trust that every county around the country is doing this. You know, ours are monitored by Republican and Democratic judges. I have a libertarian friend who says, how come you don't invite libertarians? I said, well, I'd love to, but in the statute, it refers to the, the two leading parties. And am I right about that, Brian? Otherwise, I'll hire my friend as a libertarian. But I told him he's got to indicate Democrat or Republican so that we're fair and balanced. But um, so we're very careful. And then they have to initial the ballots as they come in. And they go in a very secure location for processing. And then at 7 o'clock at night, they start being counted, and that's when you start seeing those results go up on all the county clerk election websites. Did I cover everything okay there legally, Brian? Yeah, you're, you're spot on. Um, I, I don't want to have the impression that we're trying to conceal anything as it relates to the uh, vote by mail counting process, um, but I do agree with uh, Ms. Michael that to a degree we don't want to specify um, too much that's not clearly uh, and publicly uh, readily consumable. So I think she did a good job in articulating 
per process for doing that. Uh, I'm looking, the question was also asked, when can you begin to process? Because as she had mentioned, there is a, a distinct legal difference between uh, processing and counting ballots. You can begin to process uh, sometime before the you know, actual election day. And what processing entails uh, is verifying signatures and uh, placing those ballots once they've been validated, stating that the signatures are uh, matched and things are appropriate. They can be put into a tabulator, but the results can't be tabulated. So you can't actually determine how many votes any specific candidate has prior to election day. If you uh, give me just a moment, I can give that time frame for when they can begin the process unless Ms. Michael knows off the top of her head. I'm bringing up the uh looking at the signatures. That's a, a, another very good um, topic. Uh, that's the only way in Illinois that we have, if I'm understanding the law after all these years, is our signature. Um, and who writes the same way they did 30 years ago? It hasn't been too much of a challenge. I've, you know, we've become uh, handwriting experts. You know, you can always tell that little loop that in the L and you know, we kind of go by that. And of course, these folks, if they're not them, they're committing a felony. And we have always made it very clear that we will research that and, and have never had that problem. Um, so this time, we've always used a Republican and a Democratic judge to view each signature. Well, you're only talking about, you know, 800 to 1,500. Now you're talking about possibly 20,000. But we've got that same team ready. We've got a, a big screen TV paid for by additional funds. Thank you. Uh, and that's, we're going to use it in the future. It's going to be a great asset. And we're going to shoot the, the signatures up on the screen. This year, we have to, by, by that new law, new bill, 1863, I think it was, you have to have three judges if there's a question about the signature. And they have to be representative of the two parties. And two of the three have to agree that it's not a valid signature. Now, that doesn't mean your vote's not going to count. It's just put in a separate area to scrutinize later and you follow up and you call, and you try to find the voter and verify that and then it does count. We had one where a lady was in her 80s and had had a stroke and of course she didn't write anything like she did, had gone to the same polling place for 40 years. And the judges, not like in my hometown of Lexington where everybody knows everybody, they didn't know her and they wouldn't accept her signature. Now this is at the polling place. But it's that same similar concept, you know, when they come in and they were doing the right thing. And they said, well, if this doesn't match, she hadn't brought any more ID with her. And they said, you'll need to vote provisionally. And she called me, you know, the day after that. And I said, well, didn't you vote provisional? She goes, I voted there 40 years, Kathy, and I was humiliated. But the point was, we've got to use that. And the judges were doing by law what they were supposed to do. And I uh, she did end up saying, Kathy, you, say, you sound like a nice person. I'm going to my church for, for our uh, church meeting and we'll pray for you. So I had that going for me, which was nice. But I felt so badly. But they were doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And we're going to do the same thing when we look at those. We're not going to arbitrarily reject something unless we have good, good evidence. And we're going to try as hard as we can to prove that, that is that person's vote and that's their signature. <clears throat> Um, 20,000. We're going to have 20,000 or more to look at. So we hope that they all match. So that brings up a, 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 my follow-up question around signature matching. And so, Kathy, thank you for going through the process for your county. Um, and I, I'm wondering, Brian, can you tell us, is there a, a standard process for other county clerks and election officials across Illinois uh, to use if there is a mismatched signature or there's something else that is wrong that would otherwise cause the return ballot to be rejected? Is there a system in place, um, again, kind of like statewide that would uh, reach out to those voters uh, or is it up to the discretion of the individual counties? Uh, so the election authorities were not given necessarily for a large discretion as it relates to rejecting of vote by mail ballots specific to the November uh, 3rd, 2020 election because it was addressed specifically under the vote by mail expansion. That's not the official name of it. That's what I'm going to continue to refer to it as just because it's, it's easier than identifying which specific public act it comes from because they act in unison uh, and kind of take a comprehensive approach. So 
as it relates to how election jurisdictions are to go about processing vote by mail ballots, it was specifically outlined under that new public act that deals with uh, vote by mail expansion. So uh, Ms. Michael had mentioned as it relates to um, a signature verification. So if a signature doesn't match um, in the bill, it specifically states that it has to be this panel of election judges that was specifically supplied for the purposes of reviewing vote by mail ballots within the election authorities office. Um, and it actually takes three of three judges to reject one of those uh, ballots for the purpose of signature. So uh, you have to have, it's a unanimous decision essentially that it doesn't count. Uh, and then it then it still, the ballot doesn't count as Ms. Michael had mentioned, it gets put into the side pile that then uh, there's a curing process that the election jurisdiction has to reach out within two business days uh, to that voter to let them know uh, the reason for that rejection being a signature not matching and then provide the opportunity for them to submit a new signature so that ballot would still count. However, if that um, occurs on or after election day, the election authority only has one business day to notify that voter of uh, said process for rejection and still offers them uh, the opportunity to cure that signature. So there's some built-in safeguards for this vote by mail expansion. So if a ballot is rejected for some, some reason, there is a curing process for almost all of those scenarios. Uh, thank you. Um, and we have a, a question from uh, one of our attendees uh, that's asking, uh, like you had mentioned, people's signatures change over time. And curious if you have a, uh, a recent rejection rate for, for mail ballots, maybe from the uh, presidential primary. Um, I, and even then, I, I know that there was a significant amount of in-person voting. But um, yeah, do you have a, uh, any data on that about how many ballots, uh, or, or Kathy, in your county, do you know uh, about how many uh, signatures haven't matched up maybe in the last election? None. Uh, all no. of ours have matched. And if I can only recall, um, now we always had two judges verify. I don't know that that was mandated or not, but we, we always did. So now we have three. Uh, and I don't recall any ever, you know, having a meeting about, oh my gosh, this just isn't even close. We need to call the state's attorney or anything like that. So knock on wood, but of course, you know, we're dealing with so many more than, than usual. So we'll see what happens. And I don't anticipate, I'll, I'll just add, I don't anticipate any. Maybe I'm gullible or naive. I, don't, um, I, I just don't anticipate anybody being a bad actor here. And if they are, we're going to catch it. So I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. No, you're fine. Um, I, I would have to agree as it relates to the amount of vote by mail uh, rejections. Typically, um, a, a valid reason for a vote by mail ballot. Um, not getting counted would be um, if somebody chooses to vote in person in lieu of that vote by mail, so surrendering the ballot. Those are some other, um, depending upon how it's defined by a specific uh, election jurisdiction or interpreted, that might show up in their uh, post-election reports as a rejected ballot. But I, I don't believe that to be the case. And it's few and far between as it relates to vote by mail ballots being rejected. Uh, there is a widespread comprehensive report that's available to the public that discusses how many vote by mail ballots were submitted, rejected, uh, whether they were or Kava. So over these uh, voters versus uh, domestic vote by mail, and it's the EAVES, EAVS survey that is done on the federal level through the EAC, so the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, they survey every state, so that information is readily available. Um, it's not easy to interpret, but it is out there, so. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so because of COVID, uh, there are serious concerns um, that students who might currently be living on campus uh, will be sent home in uh, maybe the coming weeks or before the election. Uh, and maybe some of those uh, students uh, had already requested a, uh, a ballot uh, from either uh, their local uh, jurisdiction where they live or at home if they're registered there. So what guidance can you give to students, but also campus administrators 
uh, for how to navigate this and uh, help students navigate this and communicate uh, to them uh, how to uh, make sure they are getting their ballot and uh, submitting it. Good, good question. I actually hadn't thought of that one. Thanks, Jacob. I, I have um, a third answer, Kathy, if you Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I actually sourced a uh, answer for this one from our public information officer who, um, if anybody has any questions, he's a, a good point of contact from the state perspective. His name is Matt Dietrich. Um, I'm actually his deputy as well. So uh, I can answer a few of those questions, but uh, what he has mentioned as an appropriate method for informing uh, students. So if you guys are looking for some, um, some way to discuss this with your students. If they are sent home, the best thing for them to do is to uh, notify the US Postal Service of a forwarding address because that in turn would return that ballot back to the election authority that sent it uh, because that is non portable mail. So that um, in fact deals with one of those uh, problems that could occur. So if you guys are sending out some sort of mass uh, communication, I would say coordinate with our public information officer if you're looking for a specific language, but um, you certainly want to notify those voters that know that they've requested a vote by mail ballot to uh, reach out to the USPS and provide a forwarding uh, address, even though that ballot would be forwarded, that would in turn indicate in the system that they're not residing on campus. Um, additionally, if, a, if for whatever reason that voter has already received their ballot, there's some fail safes. Uh, in the election jurisdiction. So again, you can surrender the ballot if they receive it because ballots uh, start getting mailed September 24th. So again, we're, we're encouraging early actions. So if you're not believing this to occur until November, then hopefully somebody has already received their ballot and returned it to the election jurisdiction. However, if they are sent home and they did not provide that forwarding address, that ballot would just be sitting in the mailbox or dorm room, whatever it may be. Uh, but Illinois election code allows for them to identify, they can then vote in person in the election jurisdiction and indicate that they did not receive that vote by mail ballot because it, that in fact is a true statement. And uh, by not receiving it, they can fill out an affidavit that indicates that they didn't receive it and then vote in the um, actual uh, polling location on election day. But that is a, a legal statement that they're attesting that they never received that. Therefore, if you don't receive the ballot, you can't return two ballots. So you're not voting in person and returning it. So just be mindful that you, uh, people always think that vote early, vote often is, is really a thing, but it's not because I assure you that each of the election jurisdictions have the responsibility to scan in any application for every voter that voted in that election. So when there's two applications per voter, um, it's going to become immediately obvious that somebody voted twice and that information will be forwarded on to uh, the state's attorney's office in the case uh, to be prosecuted, and I believe it's a uh, class three felony. So just be mindful of that. That's another good point, um, Brian, about reminding us and me to continue to work with our ISU election team. And that's why they, they are so crucial because they're going to help spread that word too. And I'll remind them of that one because I've actually kind of forgotten mm -hmm. about that because everything could change. So far, they're saying students will stay here on campus and such, but we know that can change on a dime as well. And there again, that's why we're really pushing if the voter is ready for it, to vote now. If you know who you're gonna vote for, don't wait. You won't have to worry about any of this because our early voting starts September 24th as well. Um, it won't start until later in October on campus, but we've got the new arena, which is right downtown Bloomington. That's open to all county voters. We're really spreading the word about that. Uh, and that's the big push, I think, Brian, is that, you know, don't take a chance on you being sent, sent home and you're not getting your ballot when you can vote right now after starting 20, uh, September 24th. And, and you guys having a voice amongst campuses, I think that's a good point, is to, is part of your messaging, it needs to be vote, vote early. Um, that's a widespread trend that we've been seeing for previous elections anyway, uh, as much as 40% either voted early or by mail through the previous elections. So um, as we see with other states, that's an effective method for increasing voter participation also. Um, in Illinois, having such 
open voting laws allowing for people to cast their ballots through this vote by mail early voting. There's just so many early mechanisms. So uh, I think that that should be a part of any messaging going out to, to any campus and students specifically. Thank you. And uh, for, for our attendees uh, who are on campuses, <clears throat> uh, I, there is definitely a conversation to be had too about working with your mail rooms uh, on your campuses, especially if uh, students are at home. Like uh, like Kathy mentioned, uh, you know the chance of you know the, if they don't have a porting address, if those ballots are just hanging out in their mailboxes. Uh, we've worked with some campuses that have really partnered. Their voting teams have partnered with their mail rooms to make sure that. Uh, uh, students are, are, are made aware of that and that uh, if those ballots get sent back to the local election authority that students are notified about that. Um, I have one more question I want to turn over to uh, Alexandria. Um, so if you were to look into your crystal ball on November 3rd, what are you most concerned about um, for, uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, of your work, both uh, in your county, Kathy, and then statewide, Brian? And say again, what our biggest concerns are, Jacob? Yes. Well, right now, the, which you can't control, of course, the biggest concern is will the COVID health concerns worsen? And I think that's what, when we look to the state to see if they want to postpone the election or, you know, that's, that's the worst case scenario. But otherwise, oh, I, I know one. Uh, somebody asked the other day, what if, Somebody in my election office gets COVID five days before the election. And that was a very good question, but we've been working on a what if, we have a what if team that we've had in place for a few weeks. It's what if, think of the worst case scenario other than it being so bad that we have to shut down the election. And uh, we've got that in place, I'm not gonna detail it, but let's just say we have some staff in place that are off site who are set up remotely, and are already set up with our IT. If we have to shut this place down, business will go on as usual. We have a different place to drop the ballots for the judges coming in election night. We have a different building, um, whole whole scenario. And I would urge people to, to start thinking of that too. Um, gosh, we've had some staff here with kids in school and they just found out that, you know, some COVID, they'd gone back to school and darn it, they've, they've had to go back to online because some of the kids uh, have gotten uh, COVID. So those staff we set up weeks ago to work remotely. So we continue, we can do marriages remotely from video. And so if you can do that in your county, I'd, I'd strongly urge nothing I want to tell people to do. They probably already have this in place, but that's one of those things, oh, that'll never happen. And that's what you've got to think that could happen. So be ready for it. And then the pro voting process can go on and be completed. And that's what we want to do. Not to sound overly confident, but the answer to your question is not very much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it's, it comes down to preparation and we've been working for months to the best of our ability to try to foreshadow or foresee uh, these potential uh, scenarios that could be affected. So you asked, you started this conference with what did you learn from the March primary? So we took that in stride and tried to learn to the best of our ability and anticipate uh, future issues. And I think a lot of those things have been addressed. Um, as a reminder, though, something that as we move through this uh, time of COVID that uh, we don't want people to forget about is the importance of election security. So um, while we still have uh, this environment of ever-changing uh, landscape as it relates to many different aspects of the election, we still need to be wary of things related to um, election security. So with people working off-site in all these different election offices, we still need to be mindful about phishing attempts and, and things of that nature. So uh, I would say that it's just, it's, it's less a concern and just more reiteration of fact and uh, reinstilling the things that we've been working several years to improve since 2016. Uh, so not necessarily COVID related, just some reminders to be vigilant in, in any cybersecurity posture. 
So is there a way to track absentee ballots? And is there a way to see if you already requested an absentee ballot? We have, and uh, Brian, obviously I, I'm interested in your answer to this as well. We, we don't have a place where on the website you can click and see that, you know, we got your ballot. But we have, um, and I think that's probably our future where we're gonna have to go, go that way eventually with the future. But we have a spreadsheet and granted if all 10,000 people called in at once, we'd be really busy, but they're coming in sporadically. Did you get my application? We initially started sending postcards out. We got your application, but then we realized we were gonna be getting way too many and we decided not to do that for the applications, but we are sending out a confirmation postcard because we can afford to do that this year saying we received your ballot. Now we'll answer phone calls and we can look it up real quick and we've got that same team working on that and answering voicemails. Yep, Bill, we got, we got your application. We're gonna start mailing out ballots on September 24th. Then they get a confirmation card. Our vendor is going to do that. And, and thankfully, again, we've got funds to pay for that. And it'll say, confirmed, we got your ballot. If you didn't request your ballot, call us ASAP. We think that might also help with any little shenanigans that might be going on that say, hey, I didn't request my ballot. So that's just another safeguard for us, but they will get a confirmation card that yes, and we're telling just about everybody we can in the press, if you don't get a postcard from us, you know, by, by October 1st, and that's where that first group of 10,000, start calling us, emailing us so we can start tracking down where your ballot is. And Kathy, with that, is that, uh, do you send those postcards uh, upon just receipt of the uh, ballot or is it after you've done the signature verification as well? No, because that, that would get into counting and all the ballot and everything. So it's just the receipt of the ballot. Yeah. So th there again, they'll be notified if there's a problem with the ballot after we do the signature. So right now I think they're going to get some comfort in, okay, good. We got my ballot. So hopefully. For sure. So, so some jurisdictions, uh, some jurisdictions use mail services for vote, voting by mail, Sangamon County specifically. So I reside in Sangamon County, uh, the county clerk here. Um, as part of the vote by mail ballot request, uh, you have an opportunity to provide your email address. I don't know how many jurisdictions across the state use this same type of service, but he has kind of a, a, a tracking system. So once you've submitted your application, you receive an email that says, we were in, uh, are in possession of your application, it was accepted, and then it will follow through the process. As part of the vote by mail expansion, um, while not every jurisdiction has uh, this same type of system related to tracking their ballot through each phase of the process, uh, that vote by mail ex expansion bill notes specifically that any voter who has question as to their vote by mail application or receipt of their ballot has uh, each jurisdiction has to provide a contact number uh, for voters to reach out and, and determine the status of their ballot. So while not everything is web-based, and I know that's my preference even uh, in, in tracking these different things, if you, if you go to that election authority contact information, um, in addition, it would be included in a vote by mail packet. Uh, you can certainly determine the status of your ballot. I know that uh, in some of the even larger jurisdictions, Cook specifically, I've gotten some phone calls from uh, potential voters trying to determine the status of their application. So the, the best that I can do is provide them with the contact information for that jurisdiction. And all of them uh, will certainly have some sort of spreadsheet or tracking mechanism in house that will allow for uh, anybody in the office to, to pull up and determine the status. Okay. So some of the faculty members at my school feel hesitant to encourage students to be poll workers because of COVID. Is there anything that we can tell them to reassure them? Well, no, no, <laughs> but we have a lot of older, older judges. And so you just have to, and, and they haven't dropped off. We got a lot in March of that hundred and naturally, understandably so. Um, now they've all signed up again. I was amazed that didn't want to work in March because we've learned a lot about COVID and the fact that we are going to enforce social distancing. The mask thing is an interesting 
thing because uh, Brian, am I right? We can't legally force someone to wear a mask. We are requiring masks. So please somebody correct me if I'm wrong because we're getting a lot of questions from the judges, but they're reading uh, you know, the media and things like that and, and understand that. On all of our polling places, I might digress here, but it goes back to the health concerns. And that's why with the students, wear a mask, social distancing, but the voters, if someone comes in without a mask, and I don't mean to scare anybody, but we've got to know the facts. By law, Brian, I believe that they have to be allowed to vote. You can't restrict someone from coming into the polling place. There again, that's where we urge people to early vote if there's any concerns. But I tell judges, if you have any, and this is where I thought we might run into some problems, Brian, with judges. If you have any concerns at all, don't be a judge. You know, it, it's, it, it, and they think it's worth it. And uh, that's, I don't want to say that's a good thing, but they understand the risk. Many of them have chosen to stay home and they're ready to go for 2021. But you got to understand what you feel your risk factor is and the safety there and uh, the safety of your polling place and your election officials. And you got to go from there. That's all you can do. So my response is kind of twofold. Um, I would remind your students that are apprehensive to becoming election judges that uh, the best way to understand a process is to engage it. And this is uh, part of our civic duty to serve as election judges. A lot of times people uh, that don't fully understand processes are the first to be critical of them. So I think that we have a responsibility to engage these processes in order to uh, better understand the, the landscape of elections and voting. Uh, secondly, I would say that um, there have been several things put forth that may reassure students that are wishing to be election judges. So we have CDC guidelines that are ever evolving. So I'm not going to speak to those specifically, but there were also some guidelines put forth by the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, and they are just a second. So it, it's the typical things that we've been seeing there. We're encouraging election jurisdictions to provide plexiglass shields between uh, voters as well as uh, instructions for voters to be placed on laminated cards to help uh, voters understand and hear what is being communicated and without the necessity of close contact. So an election judge will be wearing a mask. They're going to be explaining the process to the potential voters. But again, we want these barriers and social distancing to, to be there. So that is uh, actually included in the ID, Illinois Department of Public Health guidelines. Uh, and then further, my boss had put together some uh, specific guidelines for election authorities, further articulating some thing, procedural aspects to the IBPH guidelines, uh, instead of just saying, let's do the best we can, offering some potential solutions for uh, mitigating the transmissal, transmittal of, of COVID-19. Um, as Kathy had mentioned, we cannot necessarily refuse somebody that is refusing to wear a mask the opportunity to vote. However, some of the suggestions are to um, stage them in separate areas. Um, we also provide, so a concern for a college student could be, um, how do we enforce or inform individuals when they come into the polling place that it is the preference to be compliant and wearing a mask? Uh, my boss puts together some uh, information related to how to how to best handle those conversations and situations. It's part of our uh, poll worker or election judge training. So it, it's being appropriately trained is um, an important aspect to maybe mitigating some of the concerns. So the State Board of Elections actually has put out our election judge training on our YouTube channel. Uh, so any student that has questions related to uh, the process or potentially what uh, risk mitigations we have put in place, they can watch that video and understand what training, how we're training election judges across the state. Uh, and part of that is in having the conversation with voters that um, this, the state guidelines are considering as non-compliant. So um, I, I think that that's just important is, is information is keen in informing them of the full uh, process, not just don't serve, but here's some more information. Typically when people are apprehensive to do things,
just because they don't fully understand. So the best thing that we can do is provide more information and hope that that um, outweighs their burden of, uh, of serving. So that's, in my opinion, the best that we can do. That's a, another good point too. The more we communicate, and especially the students too, when they have the, those concerns, just like all our election judges are asking us because they've been judges for years, what are you doing? You know, how do we know it's going to be safe? And so I don't know that we were mandated, but I think we were, uh, Brian, to make up each election authority to have their own COVID plan. I mean, you've got to have a plan. And so we, all of us, most of us just took it from the plan that the state's giving out. And so we're inserting that in all the material that's going out to the election judges and our lead judges. They all know, here's what we're going to do. The disinfectants, the six foot, the masks. We do have to say, you know, go into detail about you have to let someone vote. And everybody felt really comfortable with that once they knew there was an actual plan in place and not just, oh, we may send out some spray and we may do that and we hope to do that. They know we've got the funding now to do that. And that has I, I can just tell in talking to them the better sense of security they have. And I think if you can help share that with our students and our ISU team, we'll do that as well. And I think that will help tremendously that they know we are mandated to adhere to these health standards and we're gonna do it. And that's why being able to uh, hire a few extra judges, they're gonna be at the door without being tyrants. <laughs> they are gonna say, would you please move back? We must be six feet apart. If they don't have a mask, even though that we can't force it, we're going to offer them one very kindly. Oh, I see you've forgotten your mask. Would you please wear this while you're voting? And I think 99% of people are going to do that. In addition, uh, thank you for, for mentioning the, the aspect of the um, ability to provide individuals that have simply forgotten uh, face covering. Uh, the election jurisdictions will be offering that. Um, Kathy had mentioned earlier that she's uh, employing several additional people that help with the election. So it's a recommendation that prior to letting those individuals into the polling place that we offer them the opportunity to uh, utilize a face covering because we want to address it before an individual comes into the building. Um, all the election judges will also be are being asked to self-screen prior to uh, serving that day. So if they've been symptomatic or there's a list of things, do you have a fever? There's a, there's a checklist as it relates to self screen for each individual election judge. Are you feeling ill? The, the, the typical na national uh, things that we have sourced to, to ensure that at least the people that they're serving in close contact or in close proximity with are um, going to be compliant. They will be wearing face coverings. I don't believe that serving as an election judge, you have the opportunity to refuse to wear one serving uh, in that capacity. So, um, um, <clears throat> so thank you both so much. Those are the questions we have. And we wanted to make sure that uh, any of our attendees who uh, might not have had an opportunity to ask a question uh, have that chance. And so between the uh, Q&A button at the bottom, and I believe that there should be a hand raise option as well, uh, and if there is, we can turn on your mic and uh, let you ask a question that way. So uh, yeah, just uh, take a minute and if uh, any of our attendees would like to ask a question, uh, please let us know. Uh, I also wanted to let everyone know that, um, so this is being recorded and we have, uh, we will be sending this to uh, campuses across Illinois, uh, specifically uh, Campus Compact uh, for Illinois will be sending it to their member campuses and then we will be making it uh, publicly available as well for those who weren't able to attend today um, because there's just so much great information that was provided here. Um, and with that, I really wanna thank uh, both Kathy and Brian for their time and their expertise. And uh, we know that uh, Life is crazy for both of you and your, 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 your teams. Uh, so thank you for taking some time out of your day to, uh, to be with us. It was extremely valuable. And uh, let's see here. I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, chat. So with that, uh, Kathy and Brian, do you have any final thoughts, any parting wisdom uh, that you'd like to uh, impart on us? I don't think so other than to say thank you. It's efforts just like this that are gonna make a huge difference. So we thank you for doing it. And uh, just again, to reiterate, as you tell your friends or anybody else, since if you've made up your mind, try to vote early. 
it, it's going to help you. You don't want the situation to get worse health-wise, and we don't want to scare people. You don't want to lose your right to vote. So the more we can spread this word out, the better. And thank you very much. For sure. Um, with that, I would like to uh, close out this session again with a, a big thank you to uh, both Kathy and Brian, as well as my co-moderator, Alexandria. Uh, and we'd love to also thank our attendees uh, for uh, the questions you shared and for being here today. And I uh, want to just thank our co-sponsors, the Gephardt Institute for Civic Engagement, the Center for Social Development at Washington University, and uh, Campus Election Engagement Project as well as Campus Compact for Illinois and Missouri. Uh, yeah, and with that, we are officially, officially going to close this session. Uh, we hope everyone has a wonderful and safe uh, rest of your week. And don't forget to vote. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Brian. Bye, Brian. Yes. Bye, Brian.